appreciate the support. I'm just gonna bring my notes up here. Great. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about how to build a holodeck. Um, you know, how I, this new generation of neural networks are going to unlock the promise of a pluriverse. So my name's Tim, um, as Karim was saying, uh, I'm a product designer and creative technologist. I've been working in UX um, over the last 10 years. Uh, and I'm super compelled by the way that current, emergent, and future technologies are allowing us to unlock new, radically helpful experiences. I've always been really passionate about emergent technologies. Um, and today, I'm really happy to share with you a big idea that I have. So I'm gonna take you back to the beginning where it started. Um, this is myself and my twin sister, Katie. Um, and the two of us would watch uh, Star Trek um, with my dad. I have a lot of fond memories um, of sitting in the living room and both of us kind of in that uh, uh, opening sequence of um, the next generation, we pretended to be the spaceship so we would zoom back and forth. Um, and I remember uh, being amazed by Gene Roddenberry's vision of a collective techno-utopian future. Uh, and reflecting on it, it's really clear to me that uh, it made an indelible impression um, and has guided me uh, throughout my life. So we watched uh, the original series, Toss with William Riker, uh, William Shatner, and also uh, The Next Generation, which definitely was my favorite. Um, and you know, over the last few decades, we've seen so many of Star Trek's uh, technological wonders jump right out of the television and into our living rooms. Um, you know, Lieutenant uh, Ahura and her earpiece for communication looks a lot like the AirPod. And we got uh, William Shatner using his um, communicator. It looks a lot like a flip phone, doesn't it? You know, even the new Motorola Razr with a foldable screen looks really retro chic in comparison. And then Captain Picard using, uh, you know, uh, a tablet computer checking his Twitter updates. It looks uh, a lot like an iPad. The resemblance I've always found uh, really striking between these two. And then when Captain Picard wants uh, a cup of tea, he says, tea, real gray, hot. Uh, and like magic, it appears in front of him. And today we've got 3D printers that can produce uh, foods like this steak uh, using cells that are grown in vitro. But the technology that really fascinated me as a boy and still does to this day has always been the holodeck. At first sight, you might mistake it for a gymnasium or a racquetball court. It's a large room with high ceilings and cubic volume, and it's completely void of any furnishings. Black tiles with a bright orange uh, kind of grout. When the holodeck is activated, though, the room disappears, and it's replaced by a realistic, interactive simulation of a physical world. And you can be anywhere. You can be in New York City. You can be on the moon. You can be in the Sahara Desert, or you can be in Peri, as Captain Picard would say. And when I was a boy, this all seemed like it belonged in a distant future, or a science fiction plot, and not something that I would see within my lifetime, and it probably still seems unimaginable to most. My mind changed on this, however, when I was eight, and I took my first steps into a virtual world, and it was at Canada's Wonderland, a, a big theme park north of Toronto, where my dad and I got the chance to battle it out in an early arcade-style VR simulation called Dactyl Langmuirs, which was released in 1991 to theme parks um, and malls and arcades. So, you know, this large helmet weighed down my tiny nine-year-old body and it probably looked ridiculous, but I remember the excitement I felt as my eyes focused on those low resolution displays. And even though the graphics were low poly and it was crude, it still felt like I was stepping through the screen and right onto the holodeck. This sense of presence and immersion, and it captivated me and became the genesis of a lifelong interest in emergent technologies and VR and human computer interfaces. And ever since then, I was following closely the development of VR, um, you know, the 
unreleased Sega VR, the disappointing Nintendo Virtual Boy, I remember trying at Blockbusters, uh, early omnidirectional treadmills, and I, you know, when the first Oculus DK1 Kickstarter came out, that was the moment. I said, this is it, this is happening, finally. You know, a, a commercially viable, affordable, high quality VR headset, all of these points were intersecting and this was gonna be it. It was the first billion dollar company to launch on Kickstarter. It was purchased by uh, Facebook, uh, now Meta. I even tried to build my own at the company I worked at, um, previously a consultancy, I, I convinced them to let me build a holodeck and give me a budget for a Valve Index. And I called it the Holodeck One because I thought it implied that we should also have a second one as well. And we kind of have one now, right? Like the, the Quest and the, the headsets that we're getting previews of from Meta and from Apple, um, you know, they're getting smaller and smaller. The level of immersion is getting great. The resolution is getting great. We can see our digital avatars with body tracking, but something is missing. And we've always talked about content. And you know, content is there. We've got lots of content now, but it's not extremely diverse. It's being made by still a privileged few. Um, and you know, what the holodeck promised was this genie in a bottle. It was the ability to imagine any world just using your natural language and have that type of ultimate freedom. You know, so let's take a look at what is the holodeck. What, what are the components we need to build uh, if we wanted to make one for ourselves? So here we have a holodeck as we looked at before. And the first thing is we've got the arch the entrance way and the computer interface. We're going to talk and focus on this first one. The second one is the holographic matter projection array. This is for my next talk. I'm serious. <laughs> um, for the arch, this is what we're going to focus on today. The creative brain and the intuitive voice interface of the holodeck. Let's take a look at the arch in action. I've got a clip here where we're going to see Second Command, Lieutenant Riker, setting up a holodeck program. Using only natural language as an input, Riker is able to request a new environment, a storyline, characters, and an experience. Anything that can be described with natural language can be materialized instantaneously. Computer, I'd like some place to play some music, a little atmosphere. Specify. Jazz. Era. Circa 1958. Location. Kansas City. No. New Orleans. Bourbon Street Bar, New Orleans. Route 2 AM. Program complete. Enter when ready. So to build the arch, we really need three components that I'm going to go through one by one in this talk. The first one, which we just saw demonstrated, is natural language processing. Natural language processing is a field uh, that evolved from computational linguistics. It's an area that I've uh, really uh, focused on in my own career, um, as well as its intersection uh, with spatial computing. And it uses methods from various disciplines uh, like AI, linguistics, data science to enable computers to understand human language in both written and verbal forms and also generate it. So that includes natural language understanding, uh, deriving meaning from language, including intents uh, and entities uh, from what's called an utterance um, or a text sequence. And uh, natural language generation is the process of formulating that computer response and generating the language required. We've seen this in um, different products like smart home speakers and displays, um, thermostats, smart home devices, uh, connected smart headphones, wearables, 
and VR headsets. Uh, if you have an Oculus Quest, you may not use it that, that much. The implementation is um, okay, but it's kind of slowly evolving. Uh, but there is a voice assistant um, on the Quest operating system as well, and it's actually a great application uh, for voice interfaces and conversational interfaces because you don't have a traditional touch screen or a keyboard and you're often busy uh, with your eyes and with your hands and those are great opportunities uh, for voice interfaces similar to when you're driving a car for instance. So I'm going to continue this scene from Star Trek that we were watching because we talked about um, NLP but I want to provide a disclaimer on the next scene because I I'm an alumni from OCAD and I studied media studies in this room and I know that this is a really great example of the male gaze in the media studies and what you're going to see is William Riker using the holodeck to create his fantasy woman in the simulation. So it's a bit cringy but I wanted to show the rest of this scene because it demonstrates a really advanced application of NLP, natural language processing. One that allows Riker to instantly create a digital agent that moves beyond the closed domain of control and command that we see with uh, assistants today towards a more convincing conversational partner and one that would be capable of passing the Turing test. Yes, because of transformers. Actually, not robots in disguise, but transformer-based neural networks. So a transformer model is a neural network that learns context and therefore meaning by tracking relationships in sequential data, like the words in the sentence. Currently, it's revolutionizing natural language processing, but also computer vision. I found this animation on Towards Data Science uh, blog, and I think they did a great job at showing why this is, is revolutionary, is we have um, RNNs and CNNs and models called LSTMs, Long Short Term Memory, um, and they have a much smaller reference window, so when we generate text with them, they often lose context. The thing about uh, transformer-based models or um, large language models is that they now hold reference um, infinitely back through uh, the dialogue that they're generating. You know, seeing this uh, work in this sentence, we can see that each word is referring back and identifying the relationships um, by using and leveraging the parameters in this very large model. You know, they're allowing us to create convincing conversational agents. You might have seen headlines about Google's Lambda model having fooled a researcher into believing that it's sentient. 
He's uh, been suspended after getting Lambda a lawyer. <laughs> At Voice at Global, which is a professional organization that I co-founded, um, we wanted to create a virtual agent for our students to help them understand the intersection of voice and VR. And I was using GPT-3. If you've ever designed a chatbot, it's a lot of manual work. The design work is um, really labored. There's a lot of uh, training with data involved as well. Um, this was my first time uh, creating one, and this is the amount of work that went into it uh, here. Um, so I'm simply describing the chatbot, but this is a conversational uh, conversation with an AI assistant who is an expert on artistic sculpture and speaks like a philosopher, and we call him the philosopher, and giving a couple lines of uh, how that AI might introduce uh, himself. Um, and you can see it in action here. Hey, philosopher, what's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is like a sculpture. It's not something that can be explained in a single word or sentence. It's not just one thing. It's many things all at once. And it continues like this, the, the dialogue. Um, and it's not closed domain, so this is not command and control, and it's not defined. Uh, it, you can ask anything. There's no fallback response. There's no, you know, I didn't hear what you said, like you might get from Alexa or Google Assistant. So now we have the first piece, next generation natural language processing, above and beyond what we've had before. What about the second piece? Next, we need to create a scene. We need to set the stage for our simulation. To do this, we need scene generation. How are we gonna get that? Again, transformer models come into play again. We've seen through the power of these models like GPT-3 and Lambda, that language can be generated. Interestingly, for the second piece, the same type of uh, transformer architecture can be repurposed, trained now with data sets that involved text and image pairs, um, so that they can actually take natural language input and generate incredibly high fidelity images. Two of the leaders here are um, OpenAI and Google again. So we'll look at a few examples here. So just taking this text prompt of a single beam of light entering a room, from the ceiling, the beam of light is illuminating an easel. On the easel, there's a Rembrandt painting of a raccoon. This is from uh, Google Imagen. A bucket bag made of suede. Teddy bear swimming at the Olympics butterfly event. <laughs> Incredibly high resolution, high fidelity images that are created instantaneously. And you could ask for a dozen of these. Meta is taking it a step further. Um, OpenAI and NVIDIA are also working in this space at creating what's called human in the loop creation, where additional input can be added through the form of a sketch. So you can see the sketch on the left here. Meta just put this research out and I just added it to this presentation a few days ago. Um, so the artist can provide both a text prompt and a sketch, uh, a segmented sketch, and then the image that's generated takes both into account. This gives a lot more control to the idea of scene creation. Imagine what this could be done if it was in 3D. Well, 3D uh, is happening now. We're moving from 2D to 3D. NVIDIA is doing a lot of work here, and it doesn't surprise me that Meta has recently made a lot of uh, investment in NVIDIA. We're seeing single view reconstruction from an image to a 3D model. Um, the potential here uh, to radically democratize asset creation is phenomenal. We can see in just uh, a short amount of iterations going from an image to a, a textured 3D model. Now if an image can be generated with natural language and a 3D model can be generated from an image, you can see uh, you know, the, the chain of events that are starting to happen. So let's look at our three pieces again. We've got natural language processing. Um, we can combine these two uh, first pieces to create a uh, simple world building uh, with natural language. We can generate an environment filled with three assets and materials, and we can be able to use these parameters uh, 
uh, as well as language with gesture, which is an excellent, uh, you know, uh, Autodesk has done a lot of research uh, into saying, you know, move this over there and using gesture in these three environments. However, in world building for virtual reality, we know that while the scene is our stage, we need code to bring it to life. And making it a living, breathing world of consequence, we will need to code. That's where code generation becomes key. And luckily, Transformer friends are up to this challenge. You may have seen headlines like this around LLMs, uh, OpenAI, um, and Microsoft's investment with OpenAI bringing out something called the Copilot for GitHub. Um, you know, we're almost there. We're almost at the point where all of this can be done. And I've got a short demo. I won't play through the whole thing, but you know, creating a space game with OpenAI's Codex can be as simple as grabbing your image and providing natural language instructions. And you can find this, um, this video on YouTube um, and watch the whole thing. Uh, they eventually make a video game just by moving step by step through to create a functional uh, game interaction. volume down on this one because this is also a really neat demo I found on just on Twitter of using uh, GPT-3 to actually generate um, I think web, web GL uh, code so that you can describe a scene and hit submit and get that 3D space. This is just the start, and it's not all three pieces combined, but it is pretty phenomenal that we're already seeing this. So the question now, you know, whenever technologists want to build something, we should always ask ourselves, should we build it? You know, I'm sure that the um, physicists involved in the Manhattan Project said the same thing, should we build this bomb? The way that we put these three things together really matters because we have an opportunity to deal with it now before those ramifications happen. So if we put these three things together in such a way that matches our current status quo, we're going to run the risk of perpetuating top-down power structures, inequalities, and uh, you know, systemic implicit biases uh, that are inherent in these models. So should we build it? Got our three pieces. Should we build it? You know, we're hearing a lot about the metaverse. It's on trend uh, since the renaming of certain companies. Who will own it? Companies are renaming themselves and positioning themselves to really own this new economy. It's enough to make a lot of us OG metaverse heads cringe, I think. I remember learning about the metaverse in Snow Crash, uh, the novel by Neil Stevenson where he coined the, the name metaverse. And now that it's been popularized, uh, it's kind of up for interpretation again, and, and ownership it seems. We don't want the metaverse to be dominated in that top-down fashion. Uh, you know, looking towards uh, Web 3.0, we want uh, some kind of uh, uh, you know, shared ownership over this space, and we want a rebalancing of that power structure. So I want to introduce a new name that you may or may not be familiar with. It, it predates the metaverse buzz and it has additional meanings, but uh, it's one that I think is really helpful. Pluriverse. So according to Merriam-Webster, the pluriverse is a world as conceived according to a theory of pluralism. What is pluralism? So the idea that there are multiple kinds of ultimate reality, that reality is composed of a plurality of entities, and that a society is a diverse patchwork of ethnic, racial, religious, or social groups, and each group should be able to maintain and develop their traditional culture or special interests within the confines of common civilization. This is the world that I want to strive for. A few years ago, I co-authored this article with my wife, uh, Lysanne Benhammer, where we started mapping out the future of our virtual spaces, and we developed a framework called the Social Spatial Matrix, a framework 
I want to introduce because I think that it's illustrating of the need to think beyond the metaverse and towards a broader and more inclusive pluriverse. Everybody right now is trying to understand what is the metaverse. Um, you know, it's ambiguous, but we, we map it out and, and we can understand everything that it entails. So if you're interested, you can always scan this um, QR code as well or find it on my website, timbedrooms.com. So we've got two axes and four quadrants. The vertical is a spectrum of how anchored the experience is between virtual and real space. And the horizontal axis determines whether these are networks that are what we call LCNs, or local community networks, which are self-organizing and organic, or whether they're GSNs, or global social networks, such as Facebook or Twitter. We've got the metaverse qu uh, quadrant. Um, this is interesting because we actually created this framework before Facebook became meta, and we said they are definitely going to be metaverse. Uh, it's self-centric, it's, it's polished, it's like Disneyland. And we have autonomous islands. These are group-centric, grassroots, tightly bound communities. We've got the digital wall. These are grounded in the real space. They're also group-centric, grassroots, um, and they're tightly bound to real space in the built environment. And then we've got the globalized village, which are grounded in real space, um, but also peer-to-peer -peer global social networks. So you have things like Pokemon Go, which are, uh, you know, or, or dating apps like Tinder, which are grounded in physical space. And transformer-based uh, models, large language models, are going to be really critical at creating the pluriverse. So democratizing access to creation for everybody, whether they are the global social network or the local grassroots network, uh, whether they are the privileged few who have creation tools, or it's somebody who just wants to create a new gathering space for their friends and don't have access to the same type of creation tools. We need these transformer-based models. Because at their core, what they're creating is a foundation model. This is a step towards generalized AI, GAI, trained on really large amounts of unlabeled data uh, to create these models. Um, they, they, it's kind of one model to rule them all. Uh, you, once you create that model, uh, you, you can do all kinds of things with it. But the question is, what are the consequences of, of building these? Who is creating these models? Where is the data coming from? Who will have access to them? Uh, and how are they being democratized? Where's the access going? Um, because we don't want to have all of the power of these models connected to a, a small amount of a few to concentrate power that way. We should have uh, equitable access uh, to, to models that are trained um, in ways that are safe. So again, we have to say, should we build it? And it can be really helpful to start thinking through what are the second order consequences of this technology? What are the things that we might not think right away, but uh, are the consequences of, of the technology itself? Because the things that we design, in turn, design us. This is a key tenet of ontological design. So thinking about the consequences, you've got top-down market control. So if you create the philosopher's stone of AI, uh, a great foundational model, and you give that to uh, one or two companies, you really create a propagation of the same uh, kind of power dynamics we have right now. You have biased algorithms. Uh, you know, I've used uh, DALI to illustrate stories before, and when you ask for an architect, you're going to only get men in your image generation. You have to say a female architect. <laughs> um, that's just one example. There, there really are implicit biases, and they call this a black box because they don't really understand. It's not explainable AI. Um, you also have addiction, and Star Trek covered this. They called it hollow addiction. Um, you also have deep fakes and misinformation, um, illegal and exploitive materials being produced biometric data combined with psychographic profiling, if you remember Cambridge Analytica. These are real concerns that are here now, um, and we need to understand them in order to mitigate against them. And all of this stuff is scary, but what about the potential? If we don't want to build this, what are we saying no to? What could the benefits be from this? The answer is that the benefits are massive. 
You have bottom-up creator-owned economies, the rise of a creator class. People who didn't realize they were creative before are able to access these tools and express themselves in new ways. Expo equitable access to tooling and creation. So instead of a select few in Silicon Valley creating our digital products, we can have uh, everybody creating their own digital products. Instead of uh, one company telling you what the interface should be like for you, if you have specific requirements and for you, uh, maybe you're a neurodivergent person and there's a bit of a mismatch between you and the interface, you can create your own interface. Uh, and also connecting isolated people with others in their community. These are all of the potential benefits. Um, but we need to actually put these three pieces together in a way that gets us there. So once more, we know that we're gaining these components to build the arch of the metaverse. And we've looked at the three components that bring the arch together, natural language processing, scene generation, and code generation. And I just want to flag, because since I initially published this article, which this presentation is based on, which is called How to Build a Holodeck, um, at the last MetaConnect conference, I don't know if they subscribed to my Medium um, newsletter. I think I only have like 60 subscribers. Um, but they uh, showed off uh, at the last one something they're calling BuilderBot. And it's a bot that allows people to create environments using voice commands. And uh, Zuckerberg gave a, a great demo of it, and it was really cool. You know, he asks for an island, he gets an island, he asks for trees, he says, give me cumulus clouds, he gets cumulus clouds. It was really compelling, and I was like gritting my teeth. <laughs> Um, but I want to point this out because they're, they're doing it. And that's important because to me, the holodeck and the arch is the philosopher's stone of the, the pluriverse. It really, you know, is the thing that's going to create that explosion of content uh, that we need. And that uh, freedom and agency and the opportunity for, for the creative class. And if it's owned by one company, uh, then we will get a metaverse. We'll get a, a top-down power structure. What we need is an open source community uh, platform, a holodeck that we can all contribute to. So I wanted to really do this talk today to spread the word about the importance of uh, foundational models of um, large language models and transformers and how important the open source community is uh, in creating alternative creation platforms. And, uh, you know, one that I've been following that I think is a great example is Bloom. Um, it's a massive, massive 100, 176 billion parameter, 59 languages, so it's not, uh, you know, uh, fed only by data and an English corpora, it's fed by 50 uh, nine different languages and it's open access. So Bloom is one example, um, but we need more and we need uh, to bring together the tools of creation and these three pieces and bring them together in a way that provides equitable access um, and an alternative platform so that we don't get stuck within uh, just one metaverse, that we have something that uh, is um, uh, democratic uh, in its distribution and allow us, us all to be a part of creating uh, the pluriverse. Thanks. Thank you for coming up. And, um, and thanks for staying, me, staying with me through this big idea. And if you want to connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can scan this QR code. And you can shoot me a message. You can always chat about it later.